So in verse 15 here, there's essentially a scientific statement being made that points to a heliocentric understanding of the universe. Hello Saints, my name is Jeff. I am a pastor exploring everything I can about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I mean everything. I am trying to overturn every rock. I'm trying to have conversation with as many people as I can to understand what Latter-day Saints believe. And the reason I'm doing this is because as an evangelical pastor, a lot of my understandings and perceptions of Latter-day Saint people and Latter-day Saint beliefs have been uninformed. And I want to be informed. And two things that I'm doing that I'm finding to be incredibly helpful is one, developing relationships with Latter-day Saints. And the second thing is reading through the Book of Mormon. Now, the last video I did in the series was on the Book of Alma, which was a marathon because it is 63 chapters and it was incredibly long. But in this video, I'm gonna be going over the next book, which is the Book of Helaman, and it's probably gonna be a much shorter video. And if you're a mainstream Christian, you might ask yourself, well, why, why would you do something like that? I mean, isn't the Bible enough? But Latter-day Saints believe something differently. They believe in ongoing revelation. So I'm not reading the Book of Mormon to determine whether it is true, nor am I reading the Book of Mormon just to nitpick and find all of the problems. I'm taking my approach as an evangelical pastor that I would normally apply to studying the Bible, and I'm studying the Book of Mormon, and I'm giving a reaction to just what is jumping out at me at face value. This not only helps me learn, but it helps Latter-day Saints understand how an evangelical or mainstream Christian is going to perceive teachings that are found in this book that Latter-day Saints believe is so sacred. So I'm gonna read Helaman, and then I'm going to recap, and then I will also provide some reaction. So now that I've set the stage, let's go ahead and dive in and begin reading the book of Helaman. Okay, I have finished Helaman, which I have to say was a much easier read than Alma, just because it was only 16 chapters instead of 63. And for the most part, everything that unfolds throughout the book of Helaman is primarily narrative. So telling the story of what's taking place with the various people at various times and various places, but it also becomes very prophetic. So it's reminding me a lot of earlier books in the Book of Mormon, like First and Second Nephi. There's sort of a blend of narrative and prophecy. And we go from the 40th year of the Judges all the way to, I believe, the 90th year of the Judges, which, like I said, takes us right up to Third Nephi and ends around 1 BC. Now, keep in mind where we are. The area of Zarahemla is essentially being overseen by judges, and there's a chief judge at this point named Pahorin. He dies and is actually murdered by an individual named Kishkumen. And there's contention about who should replace this chief judge. And of course, all the various agendas come in, some that are righteous, some are wicked. And there's an individual named Pecumeni who becomes the chief judge. But meanwhile, there's an individual named Coriantum who's leading Lamanite armies against the people. And as there's this sort of instability at that level of the chief judge role, Lamanites are pushing into the area and actually briefly take hold of the city of Zarahemla before they're driven back by the Nephites and they reclaim it, being led by an individual named Moraniha. Then Helaman becomes the chief judge. Don't forget who Helaman is. He's actually the son of Helaman, who's a son of Alma. So I know that some of the sons have the same names as their fathers and that can be confusing, but this is an individual who has direct ties to Alma. And as he is sitting in this seat as the chief judge, there arises this faction of individuals. Kishkumen is involved in it. And an individual named Gadianton, who wants to be in that seat of power, works in cahoots with Kishkumen and his cronies to try to take down Helaman so they can all have seats of power. But one of Helaman's servants finds out about this plan, kills Kishkumen, tells Helaman, Helaman tries to track down this Gadianton, but can't find him. And I know that these are details I don't typically get into when it comes to some of the occurrences in the narrative portions of the Book of Mormon, but the reason why I'm focusing in on this is because at the end of chapter two, 
the narrator steps in and basically says, don't forget who this guy is. This is not the last time we're gonna hear of Getty Anton. And he even specifies that he's gonna come in later, not at the end of Helaman, but later on in the records that are being kept. So we'll put a pin in that for now. And I will say one thing that did jump out to me just from the standpoint of how records are kept. Um, when the Old and the New Testament were written, they were written at various times for various reasons. They didn't necessarily have their proper names yet. Those names came about down the road, but for the narrator to poke his head out from behind the curtain and say, hey, this isn't the last you're gonna hear of this guy, and I'm not just talking about the book of Helaman, which is the actual book that we're reading, but talking about another book, super unique, something I've not seen in the Bible. So Helaman retains his seat as the chief judge, and there's a season of relative peace. The Nephites begin to migrate out of the land, they begin to toil with the land, they actually begin to mix with the Lamanites, and wickedness does start to take hold of the people of Nephi. And the people of Nephi are on this track now that we're gonna see throughout the book of Helaman, where they're kind of oscillating between righteousness and unrighteousness to the point that there's almost a role reversal we'll see later on in Helaman, where the Lamanites seem almost more stable and more righteous than the Nephites who seem less stable and more unrighteous. But moving on, at the end of chapter three, Helaman dies and his son Nephi fills his seat. Again, another opportunity for a little bit of name confusion. We're obviously not talking about Nephi, the son of Lehi, who's at the beginning of the Book of Mormon. This is the son of Helaman. I guess this would make him the great-grandson of Alma, or the great-great-grandson of Alma, whose son was Alma, whose son was Helaman, whose son was Helaman, whose son was Nephi. I get it. The names can be confusing, but I'm keeping track of it, and hopefully me pointing all that out doesn't confuse you. Either way, we're at chapter four here, and the Nephites are gonna have some major setbacks here. In the 57th year of the reign of the judges, the Lamanites join forces and they actually take the land of Zarahemla. And in their defeat, the Nephites descend into wickedness and it leads Moroni Ha and Nephi, the new chief judge, to confront this wickedness. And though they do repent to a certain extent and even get half of what they've lost back, I thought there was a really interesting reference here in verse 21 of chapter four, where there's sort of this realization that the Lamanites are prospering and they're actually seeing success, whereas the Nephites are being defeated. And there's a recollection of Alma's words that we see in Alma 45, just before he dies, he prophesies that this is going to happen, that the Lamanites would become greater than the Nephites. As we get into chapter five then, Nephi and his brother Lehi, I'm not even gonna get into the potential name confusion there, but let's just say these are their two sons of Helaman. They begin preaching among the Nephites and they're pretty effective at first, not only among the Nephites, but also among the Lamanites. But despite their effectiveness and despite the fact that some do repent among the Nephites and the Lamanites, those in greater power among the Lamanites capture Nephi and Lehi they put them in prison and they're actually about to be slain, but suddenly this miraculous scene unfolds where Nephi and Lehi are surrounded or encircled by fire. There's an earthquake, there's a cloud of darkness and that cloud of darkness sort of overcomes this crowd that is holding Nephi and Lehi captive. And there's a voice that three times calls from above this cloud, stating that these individuals need to repent, that the men that they have captive are righteous. And there's even one witness who can see Nephi and Lehi within this encircled fire, looking to heaven and talking to heaven. And those who see this taking place cry out in repentance, and suddenly the darkness leaves and they too are encircled with fire. And some of this really feels reminiscent and is sort of a blending of a couple scenes that I recognize in the New Testament, the Mount of Transfiguration. It's not necessarily being surrounded by darkness, but there was a cloud that surrounded Peter, James, and John, and they saw Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah. And in this case, though they don't name who Nephi and Lehi are talking to, there's a similar thing taking place. And it's also a little bit reminiscent of Acts chapter two, where these individuals are having this very holy, miraculous experiences as the heavens open up and as the Holy Spirit descends on the people in the upper room in Acts chapter two. And it really caught my attention and I'll explain to you why 
in verse 45 of chapter 5. And behold, the Holy Spirit of God did come down from heaven and did enter into their hearts, and they were filled as if with fire, and they could speak forth marvelous words. And the reason why I point that out, and again, I'm reading the Book of Mormon from a mainstream Christian view. And one thing that's incredibly important to us, I know I touched on this a little bit whenever I was covering Alma in a previous video, is this characterizing of the Holy Spirit coming up on this crowd and there being sort of an Acts 2 setting unfolding is going to be very incompatible to our understanding of the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. We very much believe that the Bible teaches that when Jesus was on earth, he was bringing God's presence in a way that it had never been experienced before, where God is incarnate, where he has made his dwelling among men. And then before he dies, he's talking about how he needs to die and he needs to be resurrected and to return to heaven because by doing so, he can then send the Holy Spirit when he does that in Acts chapter two, we believe it follows a very consistent expectation that up until that point, the Spirit of God had not been poured out that way. Yes, the Spirit of God might have been acted in certain individuals from time to time that the Lord would give to a prophet or maybe even a craftsman, but when it comes to this pouring out on a group of people and it being accompanied with certain manifestations, that is something that is very specific to Acts chapter two, where Jesus is pouring out his presence in his church so that his physical presence on earth in the church is indwelled by the Spirit of God. So this is going to be a deal breaker for someone like me reading the Book of Mormon and seeing the Holy Spirit being poured out in this way that precedes this very significant event that is talked about in Acts chapter 2 that is by Peter's own mouth the fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. But moving on here into chapter 6 as the story unfolds Peace overtakes the land in a way that I've not seen it yet here in the Book of Mormon. In fact, in chapter 6, 6 through 7, it actually talks about there being peace between the Nephites and the Lamanites. And it seems like an unprecedented peace. It even says here in verse 7 of chapter 6, And behold, there was peace in all the land, insomuch that the Nephites did go into whatsoever part of the land they would, whether among the Nephites and the Lamanites, I've not seen this level of peace yet here in the Book of Mormon, so this is a pretty significant, unprecedented moment as far as I'm recollecting through what I've read so far. But what I have seen in the Book of Mormon is anytime there is peace, whether it's with the Nephites and the Lamanites or the Nephites and the Lamanites, eventually wickedness creeps in. Chapter 6 describes that there's so much prosperity and so many of the people in the land are doing well and even getting rich that wickedness creeps in and Satan actually begins to introduce thoughts and ideas that are injurious to the people. And I don't really know how to make sense of what's being said here in chapter six, but I'll just observe that there's even a reference to secret oaths and covenants from Satan that are darkening the hearts of individuals. I see this in verse 26 and 30. I'm not sure what that's referring to because I know that oaths and covenants and some of those things are part of temple ordinances, but clearly I don't think that's what this is referring to, but I, I don't know what it's referring to, which is why I just observe it. If you'll allow me to kind of go off script here for a little bit, there was one thing that I saw in chapter six that caught my attention. It's super minor, and yet it just prompted a thought in my mind that I'd like to share with you. And it's when all of this peace is being talked about, there's a statement that's made, behold, their women did toil and spin and did make all manner of cloth, and fine twined linen, and cloth of every kind, and clothe their nakedness. So just this reference of women made something pop out in my mind, and that is there's not a whole lot of women in the Book of Mormon, and that is atypical from what I see in the Old and the New Testaments. The Old Testament is filled with so many prominent women, whether it's Sarah or Rahab or Deborah, or even whenever you get into the New Testament, you have such a prominent presence of women like Mary and Martha, and even Jesus interacting with a woman at the well. There's not a whole lot of reference to not only prominent women, but even interaction with women. And that's just something that's sort of catching my attention as I think back to what I've read so far here in the Book of Mormon. It is 
predominantly male in a way that is much different than what I see in the Bible. I'm not making a qualitative judgment based on that. It's just an observation that I'm making. And I wrote a little note down on it, so I just thought I would share that with you. But moving on, as we get into chapters seven and eight, we now have this son of Helaman named Nephi, who is a prophetic voice. He is sort of grieving the wickedness. He's confronting the wickedness in the land that is now infiltrated, not just at an everyday level, but even a government level. And he begins to call people to repentance. And he sounds a lot like an Old Testament prophet, like Isaiah and Jeremiah. Lots of warnings that if you don't repent, bad things are going to happen. Some repent, but others just aren't buying it. In fact, they're resisting whether Nephi is a prophet at all. And to prove that he is a prophet, at the end of chapter 8, Nephi essentially says, if you want to believe that I'm a prophet, uh, go to the judgment seat and you're going to find that the chief judge has been murdered. And as you get into chapter 9, the people go to the judgment seat and sure enough, he's dead. And initially people are scared, but then a conspiracy arises and a lot of people are saying, well, wait a minute, you prophesied that the chief judge was going to be dead. Maybe you're a part of his murder. And Nephi says, no, I'll give you another sign. And he actually tells them who the murderer is. And once he's caught, he will confess. And sure enough, the people find the true murderer. He confesses. And Nephi is finally believed. And at this point, going into chapter 10, Nephi is not only believed by the people, but we, we almost see him gaining a power in a way that's coming really from a voice from heaven, from God, in verses 4 through 11, that looks really similar to the type of really... Um, miraculous authoritative presence that we saw someone like Elijah have whenever he was carrying out his prophetic office. In fact, in chapter 10, verses 7 through 10, it says, Behold, I give unto you power that whatsoever ye shall seal on earth shall be sealed in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, and thus shall ye have power among this people. So on one hand, this just highlights the empowerment that Nephi is receiving as a prophet of God. But I want to touch a little bit more on this idea of what is being bound on earth is bound in heaven, loose on earth, loose in heaven. In this case, it is spoken about in the context of true power, as the power of his prophetic voice is really being endorsed by God. And clearly this is reminiscent of a couple of portions in the New Testament when Jesus is establishing the church with Peter and also in chapter 18 when talking about dealing with sin within the church, he says, Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I think it's important to sort of point out what is meant by that from a mainstream Christian understanding. It's not tied so much to having power and authority to do things in an empowered way, as much as it's tied to forgiveness from the good news of the gospel of redemption and being freed from sin, whether it be the sin that is separating us from God or whether it be the sin that is causing issues within the church, we don't really see this as a call to say, oh, now you have the power to do certain things, as much as it is God has brought the power of forgiveness and restoration and redemption into the world through the good news of the gospel by Jesus, and by being invited into that, we can now spread that throughout the world. So sin no longer binds people, and whenever we point people to the good news of the gospel, they are loosed, not only on this earth, but forever before God. So that's a slightly different understanding of that concept, as is outlined here in the book of Helaman, and how I know it sort of cascades into certain Latter-day Saint doctrines. So that just gives some insight in how we view that concept and that passage a little bit differently. So moving along here, Nephi is now more empowered in this ministry. And yet, deceit and wickedness creeps back in by the end of chapter 11. And now here we are in chapter 12 with men are wicked again big surprise. And we're actually getting some commentary from the narrator. This is one of the few times that Mormon, the one who sort of redacted these records, who we're going to learn about a little bit later, peeks his head out from behind the curtain and he's sort of explaining, this is the way of wickedness. This is sort of the cycle of apostasy that can take place 
among people. And I, I wasn't able to gather the whole idea that Mormon was speaking without a little bit of help. I did pause and I looked at a, a Latter-day Saint commentary to help me understand what was going on here. But Mormon is just talking about how God is great in one sense, but mankind in their agency is always going to find a way to exercise that agency, sometimes for righteousness, other times for wickedness, which is why we see this cycle of apostasy. Now there is one passage that jumps out at me here in chapter 12 that's actually going to seem like a major departure from most of what we've been talking about here in the Book of Mormon, but it's another area that seems so unique from what I read in the Bible, and that is in one portion of chapter 12 when Mormon is talking about the greatness of God, it almost sounds like things being declared about Almighty God in a book like Job, where he's saying things in verses 9 through 10, Yea, behold, at his voice do the hills and the mountains tremble and quake, and by the power of his voice they are broken up and become smooth, yea, even like unto a valley. If we keep going into verse 11, yea, by the power of his voice doth the whole earth shake. We're just seeing the mighty power of God on display. And then something is said in verse 15 that really caught my attention. It actually stopped me in my tracks. And it's this, And thus, according to his word, the earth goeth back, and it appeareth unto man that the sun standeth still. Yea, and behold, this is so. For surely it is the earth that moveth, and not the sun. Now, the reason why that stopped me in my tracks is because there are a lot of critics of the Bible that will say, oh, well, there's inaccuracies. For example, when a psalmist talks about the sun going up and down, we know that the sun doesn't move around the earth, but the earth moves around the sun. So that's an accuracy. That's an error that proves that the Bible can't be trusted. And the explanation that is given is that the writers of the Bible are always going to communicate things from their vantage point based on how they're observing them. In fact, when talking about what is observed in nature, there's a term called a phenomenological understanding of things or description of things. And that is from the vantage point of a psalmist, it does appear as though the sun is moving. So it's not inaccurate for them to say that because from a phenomenological standpoint, that is accurate. A psalmist is not making a scientific statement. He's actually just observing things from his or her vantage point. In fact, that's an issue that we have a lot with the Bible where people want to try to find scientific statements being made when you're probably not gonna find that because there wasn't a fully refined or developed scientific viewpoint or even scientific lens as we understand it today. And this can cause all kinds of problems, especially when you have people who want to look at a book like Genesis chapter 1 and somehow want to point to scientific statements. When Genesis chapter 1 is not a scientific teaching, if anything, it's a poetic expression of something that's very hard for us to wrap our minds around. So in verse 15 here, when there's essentially a scientific statement being made, that points to a heliocentric understanding of the universe, which would have been incredibly foreign to anyone at that time. I mean, there were some people 300 BC or so who proposed a heliocentric model, but they were widely rejected. And it really wasn't until the 1400s AD that a heliocentric understanding of the universe was starting to be embraced. For me personally, this is one of those moments that actually just makes me pause and say, well, hold on a second. How would anybody at that time have an understanding of this. For me, it is a bit of a hang up because it's breaking out of what I see consistently in the Old and the New Testaments, a more phenomenological expression of things. But I also understand what Latter-day Saints will say is that this is part of the ongoing revelation and maybe some of these specific details were in the Bible at one point, but they were lost. So rather than get into that whole debate, I'll just state that observation and move on to one other thing that caught my attention in chapter 12, and it's in verse 26, where it says, And I would that all men might be saved, but we read that in the great last day there are some who shall be cast out, yea, who shall be cast off from the presence of the Lord, yea, who shall be consigned to a state of endless misery, fulfilling the words which say, They that have done good shall have everlasting life, and they that have done evil shall have everlasting damnation. And thus it is. Amen. This very much looks like a binary afterlife. 
I would want to ask a Latter-day Saint, how does this match up to the three degrees of glory? And for someone like me who believes in Jesus, who believes that I've been washed by the blood of the Lamb, who I've put my faith in God, is it the understanding that anywhere in the telestial or terrestrial kingdom will be a state of everlasting damnation? Or is this talking about outer darkness? Any clarification that can be offered here would be really helpful because it seems inconsistent. Moving on into chapter 13, we now have a new prophet on the scene. His name is Samuel and he is a Lamanite. As far as I understand, I think this might be the first Lamanite prophet, at least that I've been made aware of. I could be completely wrong there. But he begins to bring it. He begins to speak the truth to the people, calling them to repentance, warning them what will happen if they don't repent. And he also begins to say things that is setting the stage for the eventual coming of the Son of God. He says in chapter 14, verse 3, Behold, this will I give unto you for a sign at the time of his coming, talking about the Son of God. For behold, there shall be great lights in heaven, insomuch that the night before he cometh there shall be no darkness, insomuch that it shall appear unto man as if it were day. So I'm taking this as before Jesus is born, that in this land, the night will be his day. And he goes on to talk about when he dies, the period between his death and his resurrection, it will be night the entire time. So I'm expecting that this is going to be a foreshadowing of what we might see in 3 Nephi. I've never read it, but this seems like a foreshadowing. And Samuel is foreshadowing these signs as a warning to the people that they need to repent. And in chapter 15, it seems as though the Nephites are still walking in unrepentance, where the Lamanites are walking in repentance, which leads us to the last chapter here in Helaman, where the response to Samuel by some Nephites is that they repent. Others just don't like him, so they shoot arrows at him. The arrows don't hit him. He actually escapes and he's never seen again. We are now at the 90th year of the judges. So this brings me to the end of Helaman and the stage is set for third Nephi, which I'm excited to read only because there have been so many Latter-day Saints that have explained to me that third Nephi is sort of the crown jewel of the Book of Mormon and some really important things are about to happen. But between now and then, I'm gonna be releasing other videos, which is why it would be awesome if you would like this video and subscribe. And in the meantime, if you want to support me on Patreon, feel free. If you do that, you get a little bit of behind the scenes access to certain things, some bonus content. And with certain tiers, you even have the opportunity to jump on Zoom calls with me once a month if that's something you're interested in. If not, that's totally fine too. Just keep coming back. Let's keep learning from one another. Let's keep exploring with one another. And until next time, I'll see you later, saints.